Hi everyone, I'm here to tell you a little about energy basics. So to get ready for this, I've got my solar panel earrings on that are gonna be blinking lights. I've got my energy shirt on. It says you matter unless you multiply yourself times the speed of light squared, then you energy. So hopefully many of you recognize this and reference to Einstein's equation E equals MC squared, which is talking about the power of the atom, the energy from the atom. This is just one place that we, we get useful energy. And so what we're gonna talk about is what is energy? What is power? What does it mean? And how do we transform those into useful energy for energy services, which is what we humans want. So I'm gonna go through some definitions, including some simplified thermodynamics, talk about energy quality. Then I'm gonna talk about the origins, forms of energy that exist on our planet, how we convert those to what we want as humans, and talk about the efficiency of doing those conversions. So let's start with what is energy and what is power? I first wanna say that these terms are often used interchangeably, even though they don't mean the same thing. And you'll see this a lot in the media, energy and power to be used incorrectly. So let's talk about what does it really mean? What really is energy and power? So energy is the quantity. This is the quantity that can be accumulated and transferred as heat, as work. A lot of times that's the form of energy that we're talking about. The units that we use for energy are things like joules, kilowatt hours, British thermal units or BTUs. You'll see quads when you're talking about a lot of energy. That's a quadrillion BTUs. This is energy, it's a quantity. Power is the flow of energy. It's the instantaneous rate of energy. So what kind of units are we talking about there? Now we're talking about a joule per second, the energy per time, BTU per hour. Those are your power units. That's your flow rate of energy. So how are energy and power related? Very simply, energy is equal to power times time. It's how much power times how much time you're using it. That's the accumulation of, of energy and gives you your energy. So let's do a couple analogies to kind of wrap our heads around this. The water analogies, energy is like your gallons of water. It makes it your quantity, your bucket size. Power is your flow rate. It is the capacity of your pipe. It is the flow of water. Another analogy is thinking about a car. So energy would be the distance traveled, miles driven. Power is your velocity. So that's your miles per hour. So when you're thinking about your own electricity use, for example, you are paying for the amount of energy you use in a month. So on your electric bill, you're gonna see kilowatt hours. And so what the electricity company is doing is taking the, the kilowatts, the power that you drew over the time you drew it and giving you kilowatt hours, your energy for the month. And that's, that's what you have to pay for. So that's energy versus power. So let's talk a little bit about thermodynamics and very, very simply. So hopefully you've heard of thermodynamics. Maybe you remember it um, from some of your classes. We're going to talk about it very simply and just the first and second law, because those are the most relevant to what we're talking about in terms of humans use of energy. So for the first law, I like to say and define it as you can't win. And what this means is energy can't be created or destroyed. You can transform it from one form to another, which might make it more useful, uh, but you can't destroy it over a wall. There is always the same amount of energy and this is the conservation of energy. So if it's a conserved quantity, that why do we always, why do we still talk about using up energy? Well, even though overall it is a conserved quantity, things like energy resources like coal and oil and uranium for nuclear, those can be used up. Those are resources that we can use up that form of energy and convert it to other forms of energy that aren't as useful. So we can use up energy resources, particularly our fossil fuels and our nuclear energy and not have that, that in a useful form for the future. The other thing to think about when we're talking about energy be conserved is if, if that's the case, then why don't we run out of energy on, on Earth if we're converting it from useful forms to non-useful forms? Well, the, the big answer to that is we've got a fusion reactor in the sky called the sun. It's constantly providing more energy to our system on Earth. So even though we're losing some of energy out to space, 
we have the sun providing more energy on earth so we're not going to run out of of energy overall okay so that's the first law second law you can't even break even so not only can you not win you can't even break even in other words there's always losses as you're converting energy forms from one form to another that might be more useful and for second law it's often call, called out in particular that heat cannot be con completely converted to work there's always losses and often high losses and that's going to be important as we start talking about how do we convert some of our energy resources into useful energy services other part of the second law is not only can you not break even it's all downhill from here. In other words, the entropy, the, the disorder in the universe is always increasing. A closed system is always going to tend towards a state where none of the energy is useful. It's going to get to a max, maximum entropy state. All right. So that's kind of the gist of thermodynamics, and that's as much as we're going to get into in this segment. But let's also talk about another aspect of energy. Energy not only has quantity, it also has quality. What does that mean? Quality means how useful is it? What is its ability to cause change given its surroundings, given where it's at? Where it's at? And so this is often termed exergy. Exergy or energy quality is not a conserved quantity. So quality, the quality of your energy can be destroyed. For example, work has a higher quality than heat, but you could convert work to heat. You can convert it from a high quality energy to a low quality energy, even though quantitatively they might be the same. Another example of something having a higher quality than lower, lower quality. So you could have a kilowatt hour of electricity as energy. You could do a lot with that. You could have a kilowatt hour of hot water in a bathtub. Uh, you can't do a whole lot with that. That's low quality energy. Same quantity, different quality. All right, so let's give it a simple example of quality. So if I was holding a weight above the ground, it's got a pretty high potential energy. It's got potential energy. It's pretty high quality. I could do something with that I, because I have that potential energy. I start dropping the weight. Potential energy is converting to kinetic energy. Still pretty high quality. I could hit something with that. I could spin something. I can make electricity. I can do something with that. Still pretty high quality. That weight hits the ground. No more potential energy, no more kinetic energy. A lot of that energy goes into low quality heat that is dissipated into the air. Now that same quantity of energy is really low quality. I can't do anything with it. So that's what we're talking about with uh, energy quality. That's an aspect to think about of our, in terms of our energy. So when we're really talking about energy and what we're talking about in the media, and when we're talking about addressing environmental issues and providing services for humans, we are talking about these big categories of energy. So what I'm showing here is kind of a map, a way of thinking about our energy system. We have our primary energy, our energy resources. This is what exists. And often that what exists is not in a form that is useful for the energy services we want, which is this is the human side of things. What do we want? We want cold drinks, we want hot showers, we want our phones charged, we want our computers to operate, we want lighting and heating and cooling and cooking. This is the human services. And so our energy system is all about taking this primary energy or energy resources and making them into the energy services that humans want. That often requires secondary energy or energy currencies, because a lot of times those, those energy resources aren't in a form that can directly give us the energy service we want. We have to take it through a secondary energy like electricity, gasoline, things like that to get the energy service we want. And then of course, the other aspect on here is energy storage. You'll hear a lot about energy storage. And if you wanna find out more about energy storage, check out the energy storage lecture. But energy storage is, can we store this energy to make it even easier to have it available to provide our energy services? For energy storage, it's often referring to actually energy for electricity storage. So something like pumped hydro, batteries, that's used for electricity storage. But if you think about it broadly, even a pile of coal or a pile of wood could be considered energy storage, depending on your application. All right, 
So that's kind of the big picture of we're going from energy resources, which we'll talk more about, to what humans want, which is our lighting and our heating and our, our transportation. So taking two of the largest energy systems and breaking it down, here I'm showing you the energy system for oil and the energy system for coal. And so what we're talking about here is all this, the conversions and the stages that it needs to go to, to go from that existing energy resource on earth to the services that we want as humans. So let's start with oil. Let's talk about oil. We have to get it out of the ground. We got to transport it to refineries to break it down into different products that we want. We got to move the gasoline to your gas station so that then you can move it to your car. And then your car uses that gasoline to convert from chemical energy, which is our fossil fuel, to mechanical energy to move your car around. And then that can finally move you around as our transportation service. Okay, so for that system, we're talking about putting in 100 units of energy resource, 100 units of oil, and getting one to 10 units of energy service out of it. So it's a very inefficient system from start to finish when you think about it this way. And even just the just from the, the gasoline to, to moving you around, only about 1% of the energy in that gasoline is actually moving you around. About 10% of that gasoline is moving the car around. And then there's all sorts of losses. And there's all sorts of, of inefficiencies in terms of how you drive and things like that that occur. So that gasoline is being lost and not actually providing that, that energy service you want. Okay, so the other major example, let's talk about coal. Okay, we gotta get coal out of the ground. We put it in a power station. Power station is like a third efficient, maybe 30, 35% efficient. So two thirds of the energy from your coal is lost right, right off the bat when you're making electricity with that coal. Okay, it's pretty efficient to transport it as electricity. You're putting it in your lamp. You want some lighting and the service you want is illumination. So again, you're putting in 100 units of that energy resource, maybe getting one to 10 units of energy service out of it. These are very inefficient systems. And what does that mean? That, that if inefficiency basically means you have more of those environmental impacts all along the energy system, more losses, you have to get more coal and oil to get that service that you want. And so a lot of what we're talking about when articles and people and governments and things are talking about transitioning to a cleaner system, to cleaner energy systems, uh, it's, it's talking about we, we need to do better. We need to do better in terms of efficiency. We need to do better in terms of types of energy so that it doesn't have the negative impacts at each of these stages along our energy system. So let's talk a little bit more about efficiency since I was just referring to it in terms of our energy system. So if we're talking about efficiency, the efficiency from our, our resource, to our service, we wanna know the efficiency of the overall system. We just multiply the efficiencies at each stage. That'll give us the overall efficiency of our system. Okay, and so what we're looking at here is say we have that coal-fired power plant, it's, like I said, only about 35% efficient, pretty efficient to transmit the energy and then you're using it in an incandescent bulb, pretty inefficient. So your overall efficiency in this system is only about 1% not so great in terms of efficiency. All right, what if we do some efficiency improvements? We, instead of coal, we're gonna use state-of-the-art natural gas power plant. Instead of that incandescent bulb, we're gonna use state-of-the-art uh, LED bulb. Okay, and so we're improving our efficiency. And so our overall efficiency is closer to 8% instead of 1%. It's a huge improvement. One of the things I want you to realize on this, and one of the things we think about with efficiency is your end use really matters because you have compounding impacts as you go back up the system where you're starting from. And so getting that end use even a little bit more efficient, especially over a lot of bulbs or, or a lot of service can really impact the front end because that hasn't had the, the efficiency losses yet. So that end use is really important. But I also want to point out that efficiency isn't everything in terms of like your system, you need to think about efficiency and, if, and improving efficiency is always better. But it's not the only factor to think about when you're thinking about what is the lowest environmental impact or lowest social impact, or whatever factor you're thinking about. 
So for example, if we just took out the transmission and the, and the natural gas power plant, we just put some PVs on top of your roof and powered your state-of-the-art LED. This is lower efficiency because your PV power panels aren't so efficient, but your energy is free. It's not depletable, it's not polluting, there's no water, there's no greenhouse gas emissions. So this might be the better solution, even though it is less efficient. So just something to think about in terms of efficiency. All right, another thing to think about in terms of energy resources and the energy service that we get, think about matching your energy resources to the use. So this is a cartoon from one of my favorite books called The Return of the Solar Cat showing the book basically shows how much smarter cats are than humans in terms of getting the energy services they need. So here's your cat, it's cold, burr, it goes and sits in the sunshine and purr, it's warm. Human is cold and he says, I know I'll go to the ends of the earth and dig for oil and coal and uranium and build refineries and power plants to power my solid state blanket. So the point here is it matters. And we, what we wanna use is we wanna use things that are like low quality heat for services that only need low quality heat and save our high quality energy energy resources or our energy currencies like electricity for uses that really need that high quality energy. Okay, so there's some aspects of energy resources. Let's talk about a few more of them. So I want to give you a sense of what energy resources exist on earth and what form they exist in because that's gonna matter in terms of how useful that is and how many conversions we have to make to make it into useful, to provide our, the energy service that we want. So our end use sectors here and our residential and commercial, this is lighting and heating and all the things that we need. These green bubbles are our renewable resources. So biomass and solar and ocean, wind, geothermal, these are renewable. Our blue bubbles are depletable resources, so like fossil fuels and our nuclear fuels. And so what I'm going to talk about is the form that these exist in. So our sun is a fusion reactor. It's impacting and creating a lot of our renewable resources. And of course, our fossil fuels are just old biomass. It's biomass that has been crushed over millions of years in the pressure cooker of our crust and become fossil fuels. So just think about it as ancient biomass that was also powered by the sun. All right, so how do we use these energy resources to get those human services we want? One is the sun gives us radiant energy. We have gravitational energy that's going into our tides, and our hydro motion energy, that's how it exists. Biomass, fossil fuels, those exist as chemical resources. So we can get energy out of those by burning. Our nuclear fuels like uranium, that's nuclear energy that's making the use of the power of the atom, just like we talked about at the beginning of the, the lecture today. Then we have things that exist as thermal energy. Solar gives us thermal, ocean stores solar energy as thermal. We get geothermal from the center of the earth. So we have thermal resources. And some of these we can use directly. We can use sunlight to light our buildings through windows, radiant energy. We can use thermal energy from the sun, from the ocean, from the earth to do direct heating, direct heating needs. But for many of these energy resources, we are converting them to higher quality energy resources with all of those losses so that we can do many more things with them. So for our chemical and our nuclear, we are converting those to thermal energy by burning them or by using the power of the atom taking that thermal energy and doing mechanical energy with it. So you can use some of our mechanical energy directly, or we can take that mechanical energy and create electricity. And then we can use electricity to give us our end use sectors. But you can see that we're doing conversions of our for the forms of energy that exist to get the human services we want. So I kind of alluded to this, but our energy resources can also be divided into two basic categories our stock resources and our flow resources. So what are we talking about here? Our stock resources are our fossil fuels, that's coal, natural gas, oil. We have a finite amount, at least on human timescales, because it takes hundreds of millions of years to turn biomass or, or into those, those resources. We have a finite amount of uranium 
on our planet. So there's stock resources on human time scales. And then we've got renewable resources. These are flow resources. So we think about them more as how much energy do they, do they have per year? Because they're constantly being provided, they're constantly being powered by the sun, wind, ocean thermal, biomass. These are all constantly being powered by the sun. So let's think about the quantity of these resources to just put them in perspective. Here is this little bubble over here, kind of represents the amount of energy the world used in 2019. Here's an estimate for the world's needs in 2040. Just these little bubbles compared to how much solar energy is provided to the earth in one year, how much coal exists on our planet, how much natural gas, oil, uranium exists on our planet, how much wind we have on our planet compared to the energy consumption. So just to give you a sense that it is not a lack of energy resources in terms of our energy needs and providing our energy needs. It's how do we choose the right energy resources in order to decrease the impacts on people, the environment, on societies. Another way to think about energy is in terms of its density. Energy density matters because we have to move our energy around. Um, and it matters because it, it can impact how much space it takes up to get energy out of that resource. So there's a lot of different ways to, to think about our energy density. It's usually thought about in terms of energy per volume or energy per mass. Both volume and mass matter a lot if you're thinking about transportation. And so something like oil, which you're looking at this marble of crude oil gives you the same amount of energy density as a milk jug of natural gas as it exists. You can see why oil is so advantageous when we're talking about transportation, where you have to move your fuel around with you. Both the volume and the mass of it matter. We've got the energy density of some other energy resources down here. The one that stands out, and I love this cartoon for how it stands out, is uranium. Nuclear energy, the power of the atom, is extremely energy dense compared to other energy resources. And so if you're interested in nuclear, check out the nuclear energy lecture. There's going to be a lot more about how that energy density is, is one of the things that, that nuclear advocates are re get really excited about is how little uranium it really takes to have a lot of, provide a lot of energy. So we have, we have our energy resources. They have some different, their stock or flow. But again, they usually aren't in a form that's ready to provide the energy service or oftentimes not. And so we have to convert them. And so this is just giving you a map to, to look at where our energy resources are up here, where extraction and, and treatment to get up to our primary energy. We have to convert them all the way down to end use technologies to actually get the energy service that we want. So there's lots of conversions going on. And each of those conversions are having losses. There's also technology that is doing the conversion for us. So turbines, for example, use fluid flow to produce work. So some examples are like in hydroelectricity, we're using the gravitational flow of water and converting it to mechanical spinning. That's what the turbine is doing. Turbines also are used for in wind turbines, like you see behind me, to turn the motion of the wind into a rotational mechanical energy. Heat engines are using heat to produce work. And we'll talk more about those in a minute, but now you're taking chemical to thermal to mechanical energy through a heat engine, which is using both the heat flow and turbines oftentimes. And then you have things like the generator, which is using rotational mechanical energy to convert to electrical energy. So there's all sorts of technologies and conversions happening in our energy system to get us those energy services that we want. So let's delve into the heat engine for a minute as an example of a way that we convert from energy resources to the, the energy currencies that we want to provide our energy services. So what is a heat engine? A heat engine is basically making use of the fact that heat will flow from hot to cold to produce work. So we've got our, our high temperature source, that's where it's really hot. We've got a low temperature sink, it's cold. And our heat is going to flow from one to the other 
And we're able to extract work out of that flow because it's going from, we have heat going from hot to cold. That is, that is a, at its basis, a heat, a heat engine. The heat that we lose to that cold is kind of inherent losses to our heat engine. The heat engine can only get so efficient because you do have to have that driving force from our hot source to our cold sink. So let's look at a couple of examples. Big example, this is the steam cycle. Okay, what is a steam cycle? This is also called a thermal power plant. It is, it is the most common way we make electricity today in our systems. This is how we make electricity for coal-fired power plants. This is how we make electricity for nuclear power plants, for a lot of natural gas power plants, for biomass power plants. This is how we're converting those energy resources into electricity. So what do we do? We need our high temperature source. So we're burning the coal, for example, to heat up water and make steam. So we're just boiling water to make steam. We have a cold temperature sink that's often a cooling tower river water, ocean water, something that's cold that will pull the steam from your high temperature source to your cold temperature sink. So this motive of that steam moving through the system turns a turbine, makes it spin. That's the work we're getting out of that heat. And that turbine can turn a generator and make electricity. Then we can circulate that water now that it's cold back around and do it again and again. We lose a lot of the heat into that cold temperature sink. It's why you can't, you can't fully convert heat to work. There's a lot of losses in a heat engine. So when we're looking at the losses and the efficiency of our conversion, for any of our conversions, what does it mean? What is our conversion efficiency? Our conversion efficiency is how much useful energy we got out divided by the amount of energy you put in. It gives you a sense of the losses on that conversion device. So I've got a couple examples. Let's, let's walk through the first one. Okay. So you have 200 joules of energy supplied to your hair dryer. Only 80 joules of it becomes useful energy. In other words, only 80 joules of it actually is drying your hair. 120 joules is wasted. How efficient is your hair dryer? You're taking the useful output divided by the input, you get 40% efficient hair dryer. So where is that wasted energy going on your hair dryer? Well, some of it's not actually hitting your hair, so it's just dissipating into the, the room. The noise that the hair dryer produces, that's also wasted energy. So you hear loud fans or things like that, that those are losses of your energy. And it could just be in terms of like how much is actually evaporating the water off your hair. Okay, so there's lots of different ways you can lose those losses happen. Another example here, and I'll let you look at it on your own, but again, thinking about the output, the useful energy that you get out, divided by the energy you get in, gives you the efficiency of your system. So in terms of heat engines, there is a specific way that we look at the ideal world efficiency for heat engines. And so this gentleman here that I pictured, Carnot, came up with this very simple equation to figure out the efficiency of a heat engine in terms of its limits. So when we're talking about ideal world, this is not actually what you can do in the real world, but it's the best you could possibly do, which for a heat engine is not going to be 100%, because as we talked about, there's inherent losses in that heat that you lose to your cold temperature sink. So how do we figure out the Carnot efficiency of our heat engines? Our efficiencies is equal to one minus the temperature of your cold sink minus the divided by the temperature of your hot source. Those temperatures have to be in absolute temperatures. So remember this from chemistry, Kelvin, ranking, those are absolute temperatures. You can't use Kelvin, you can't use uh, Fahrenheit or Celsius. You've got to convert it to Kelvin or ranking for this equation to work. But it gives you a very simple way of looking at how efficient could my thermal power plant actually be? This is, this is a way to do that. It's called Carnot efficiency. So to give some typical conversion efficiencies from different uh, type forms of energy to other forms of energy, this are approximate energy, energy conversion efficiencies from, from more, some of the more common conversion technologies. And you can see going from heat to mechanical energy has very low conversion efficiencies. Whereas using elect electrical energy to do things, much more efficient, much more high, high quality um, energy, you can do a lot more with it. 
So to wrap up conversion efficiency and conversion efficiency limits and getting the end of our energy basics, let's talk about some very common conversion technologies that you've probably heard of and you, and you see, and what are the limits? Like how good can we actually do if everything went perfectly? So we've talked about our heat engine, our steam cycle power plants, like our coal and, and nuclear power plants. The real world, ideal world efficiency is somewhere around 60%. Depends a little bit on how hot you can get your steam and how cold your, your, your cold temperature sink is, but it's gonna be somewhere around 60%. So our real world efficiency is somewhere in the 30, 40% range. We're only able to get up to about 60% when you're talking about a simple steam cycle power plant. Our hydroelectric turbines, on the other hand, very efficient in terms of their real world efficiency and their efficiency limits. Wind turbines, now we're talking about the efficiency of taking the energy from the wind through the turbine to create the electricity. And you've got a limit of somewhere again, around 60% in terms of that efficiency limit. We're seeing real world efficiencies in the 30 to 50% range. So getting pretty close to our real world efficiency limit. Solar PV, depending on, what, on how you're doing your solar, there's, there's things called single junction or multi-junction. What you see mostly on houses and out in utility is, is going to be this in the single junction category. That's really what we're using at a commercial scale. Pretty low real world efficiency, ideal world efficiency, 33.7%. It's the best we can do. We're doing around 20% in the real world, almost 30% in a laboratory is the best we've done. So again, this is to give you a sense that it's not, we're not aiming for 100% efficient in a lot of these. In a lot of these technologies, we're just trying to get as close as we can to their ideal world efficiency. The internal combustion engine, that's the engine that drives your gasoline car. That also has pretty low ideal world efficiency, somewhere around 50%, again, depending on the exact engine. And many of the, your, your internal combustion engines in your cars, somewhere around 20% efficient overall. They can have peak efficiencies around 30 to 35%. That's when you're driving when it's at its, its absolute um, optimal engine um, operations, but that's only happening some of the time because you're accelerating, you're decelerating, you're going fast, things like that. So your average is around 20%. So just giving you a sense of conversion efficiency and conversion efficiency limits. I hope this was helpful in giving you some energy basics. Now you know the difference between energy and power a little bit about thermodynamics and energy quality and a map to think about the energy resources and the energy services that we're using those energy resources for and what kind of efficiencies we're looking at. So thank you for your attention and I'll see you next time.